Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Lynn Fitzhugh, and I'm going to be talking about how our agricultural system works in the US and how that affects the greenhouse gases, how it affects the food that we buy and consume, and how that can help change our situation about climate. So. This um, EPA chart, before they took down all the EPA information, um, <laughs> shows that uh, agriculture is 9% of our overall greenhouse gases. Now, this is deceptively low because um, in the transportation sector would be some uh, portion of transportation that we're doing for agriculture. And in industry would be the percentage that is for food packaging. And shockingly, um, while it's hard to find studies that are accurate about this, um, the packaging is probably about another 10%. So when you, when you start adding this up, very quickly it becomes a huge sector of, of our overall problem. So I have something that's called the Food Challenge, and I am encouraging all of you to take the Food Challenge. Um, and it has four aspects, to eat local and seasonally, to eat organic, to eat less meat or dairy products, uh, some would call that eating a plant-based diet, and to waste less food. In the book Drawdown, which you just all heard me talk about a minute ago, um, they rate those 100 solutions, and as previously mentioned, the first one is refrigeration management. But get, look what is number three. Oh, sorry. Number three is reducing food waste. And number four is plant-rich diet. So I was really excited um, when Drawdown came out to realize like, that this campaign that I was doing um, uh, was um, you know really right there at the very top of the thing. So this is why the food thing is a significant uh, piece of the puzzle. So I'm going to have you guys guess how many miles do you think it takes for food in the U.S. to get from field to table? Throw out a guess. 3,000. She says 3,000. 500. Okay. The correct answer is 1,500 miles. And the reason it takes that long for the food, th that many miles for the food to travel is because it changes hands on average six times. Um, we've got the food traveling. Um, fruit sometimes is taken to other countries to be processed and then comes back again. So that's the kind of crazy, you know, so it, it goes from fields to a processing place. It may go from a processing place to another processing place, especially if you're creating a processed food product. Um, and then it has to be shipped to its final location. So um, when we talk about local, that is generally defined as within 500 miles, which is still really long, um, but we have a big country. So what? What would eating local actually look like? It means eating from farmers markets or from community um, supported agriculture. Um, community supported agriculture, if anybody doesn't know, means that you get a um, kind of food plan or a food agreement um, with a farmer and they will give you um, your share that you pay for every week. And so you get to enjoy um, absolutely fresh food, and to also establish a relationship with a local farmer. So local gardening um, also is part of this. Uh, there are some people who will remember that during World War II, we had victory gardens. Um, we, the U.S. did that because a lot of the food that the farmers were growing was being shipped overseas to our troops, and so people were encouraged to do gardening to produce the food that they need. And 40% of the food that was eaten in the US during World War II was grown in those victory gardens. So that's kind of an indication of what we can do when we put our minds to something and when we really focus. 
So low till versus tractor tilling. The, tradition, the, the way that big agriculture um, does uh, tilling is, as you can see in this picture, with uh, fossil fuel driven um, vehicles. But the more uh, climate relevant matter for this is when you make those deep grooves in the earth, carbon is released. When you do a low till m method, you are conserving um, carbon, you're keeping it in the ground. So this is an example of if we are to move to climate smart policies in the area of food, this is some of the kind of stuff that we're going to have to look at and think about. So um, benefits of eating locally. Um, it's fresher, it's better for your immune system, it's less processed, it supports local economies. When a dollar is spent into a local economy, it travels six times around the local economy rather than if you send, spend it in a big chain and it goes back to corporate headquarters, we don't know where. Um, and so it's also a way that you can support local farmers. So there are policy changes we need to make in each of these areas. And I'm just going to talk about this one thing as an example. So this is um, what um, bee colony collapse disorder looks like. And when this first was being discovered, they didn't really know exactly what was causing it. But research now has pretty clearly shown that this is a result of the pesticide, um, I can never pronounce this right, neonicotinoids. Neonics, just call them neonics. OK, thank you. <laughs> um, so the bees are really um, made vulnerable by this. And then any other kind of bad thing that happens to them, um, they start dying. And you have a whole collapse of a, of a colony, like you see in this picture. Um, so in 2015, we had a 44% die off of bees. And this has been happening year after year, where significant portions of the bees are dying. Um, and this matters because one third of all the bites of food that we eat come from pollinated um, fruits or vegetables. So we're going to be in a whole lot of trouble if we can't protect the bees. And as we are headed into drought and that sort of thing with climate change, um, it's even more important that we protect our bees. So there's been, uh, even though we haven't been able to get national legislation on this, um, there's been a number of campaigns to pressure places like uh, Lowe's and Home Depot um, to stop carrying uh, this. And those, those have been successful, but they're having to do it kind of one uh, place at a time. So you know, you can encourage places that you know to not carry it, and you can not use um, things like Roundup on your lawn. So then turning to the organic area, what is better about organic? Now, this is instead of a bar chart, so the length of those petals sort of indicates um, uh, how strong something is. And I know you can't, from where you're sitting, uh, read that. So I'm going to kind of go around it so that you know what it says. So if you look at the organic one there, the very first blue petal is soil quality. Then we have minimizing energy use. Then we have biodiversity. Then we have minimize water pollution. Then we have profitability. We have total costs. We have ecosystem services. The first green one is employment of workers. The next one is reduce workers' exposure to pesticides. And then we have minimize pesticide residue. And then we have nutritional quality. And last, we have yield. So you can see on almost every category, uh, organic is beating conventional. So what are the problems with big agriculture? Um, since the 1920s, um, uh, it has really taken off the, the industrial way that we now do farming. Um, uh, organic had its rise in the 60s um, to address the abuses of big agriculture and the concerns with social justice issues. Um, there's only been labeling for organic since 2002. 
40% of all energy used for industrial agriculture is for fertilizer and pesticides. Thus, organic food systems use 30 to 50% less energy. They also uh, sequester 28% more uh, carbon into the soil. The application of fertilizers and pesticides are bad for the soil, for the workers who pick the plants, and for our health. The fertilizers use natural gas. The application of both fertilizers and pesticides involves more fossil fuel driven delivery methods. And um, there's a wonderful workshop that's going to be the third one, um, which is about um, regenerative agriculture. And so you can learn a lot more in that one about what we could do instead that would be regenerative to the soil. So I want to talk about the myths about organic. Um, the main myth about organic is that we have to have industrial agriculture in order to feed the ever-growing um, world population. This is mainly propaganda, uh, which has been put out by the fertilizer and pest pesticide industry. There's a long-term study that was done by the Rodale Institute. Um, that shows that crop yields from organic and synthetic chemical farms are similar in a year of, of average precipitation. However, during droughts or floods, organic farmers did better due to stronger root systems in organic plants. Data also showed that organic production required 30% less energy than the chemical pr production when growing corn and soybeans and organic farmers create more jobs because the labor of, um, that is needed is approximately 50% higher. Um, and the net economic return for organic crops is equal to or higher than that for, for chemically produced crops. Um, the study uh, also uh, finds that organic farmed soil stores a lot more uh, carbon, as I've already mentioned. Organic farming can pull on an annual basis thousands of pounds of carbon dioxide per acre right out of the air and store it in the soil. So we have two ways of doing that. We have trees and soil. They are the places that store uh, carbon for us. Um, a UN and World Bank study determined by that 400 scientists and 58 countries um, participated in in 2008 unequivocally recommended a return to traditional natural farming methods um, as the best way that we have of stopping climate change. So the question always comes to me, why is organic so expensive? Right? It is not, it, intuitively, it doesn't even make sense. Like they've added stuff to the other stuff. They haven't added it to this. So why would it cost more, right? It doesn't make sense. Well, the answer is, that under the U.S. Farm Bill, which is passed every five years, industrial agriculture receives subsidies, sometimes as much as a million dollars for a big mega farm. So organic farming does not usually qualify for those loans. Um, so they're competing against subsidized farming. This is just like you, what you experience with big oil and big coal, where they get subsidies that help artificially bring their costs down, and then our alternative energies have to compete against them. Um, so this is another example of where we're subsidizing the wrong thing in our national policies. Um, so there's always a concern, you know, organic's more expensive. What does that mean for low-income people? So I'm relatively new to um, Olympia, having moved from Seattle. So I'm going to tell you about something that exists in Seattle. It may exist here. And if it doesn't, well, then we might want to create it. It does. It does. OK, thank you, Marilyn. Um, so there's a, pro a program in Seattle called Fresh Bucks. And what it means is that anybody who's on SNAP, which is the sort of equivalent of food coupons in the old days, um, if they use the Fresh Bucks program, if they were going to spend $10 at a farmer's market, they can instead spend 20 It will double the value of what they're doing. Um, so that um, makes organic more affordable um, and allows people to get out of the grocery stores and into the farmer's market. 
So advantages of eating organic. Widespread evidence that it's healthier. Research links agricultural chemicals and GMOs to asthma, allergies, autism, ADHD, cancer, diabetes, infertility, childhood leukemia, obesity, organ failure, accelerated aging, Parkinson's disease, genital malformation, and intestinal damage. Quite the list, huh? <laughs> um, so if you're eating organic, you're not um, getting your several pounds of uh, chemicals a year. Um, you're helping to produce more food than traditional agriculture. You're not creating coast coastal dead zones in the water from the runoff of the pollutants. Um, and you're keeping nutrients in the soil um, so that the soil is actually more rich and pre produces more nutrient-dense food. Um, I'm going to actually skip this slide because, sadly, under um, Trump, it's very hard to get policy changes right now. So eating less meat. Um, it turns out, if you look at many different um, things of what you can do with your own individual carbon footprint, one of the most accessible things to us as a change that we can make is eating less meat. Um, so this says 494 pounds of carbon um, per year for each day of the week that you cut meat out of your diet. So if you were to go from eating meat every day to being a total vegetarian, that would be 2,718 pounds a year cut out. If you were to become vegan and cut out um, dairy as well, it would be 3,459 pounds. And just as a comparison for that, um, 5,600 miles uh, pounds equals uh, driving 12,000 miles a year in a 21-gallon car. Um, so that's an average car in the US. Um, the 3,000 400 figure of the vegan is essentially the same as driving a Prius. So, you know, you could give up driving or you could give up meat and you'd have about the same effect. This is a fascinating chart. Um, again, I know you can't see exactly what it says, so I'm going to explain it to you. So if you start at the very bottom with that red line that runs off the end of the chart, um, that's lamb which is the worst carbon food that there is. It's two times higher than beef, which is the next line that comes actually to the end of our chart. Um, and after that, you have cheese, which comes from the beef. Um, then you have pork, then you have salmon. Now, they are assuming in this that the salmon is being flown across the country. So it's not quite as bad here. Um, then there's turkey, then there's chicken. Then there's tuna, then we have eggs, and then we run into a whole variety of vegetables that are just less and less carbon footprint. So one of the things that I say to people is if you're not ready to make that big change, but you just want to start to shift towards more of a plant-based diet, then at least consider when you're eating meat, which meats are you eating? And try not to eat the worst ones. And we even have an advocate here who, uh, who's advocating with you that you eat less beef. The chickens, however, have their opinions on the matter as well. So. Lynn, could you uh, go back and repeat what it said about the cheese versus, che cheese isn't more than chicken, is it? Um, it? It is, and I can't explain to you all the reasons why, but it has something to do with the way we do the beef, right? The, the beef that, the, the cows that are producing the cheese. Oh. Yeah. So that's that's why cheese winds up having a footprint. I'm going to take one more question, and then I'm going to ask people to hold questions to the end. Yes. I just wondered where the chart came from because I, I'd like to go back and look at it. Absolutely. Again than try Absolutely. To copy this this chart is from the Environmental Working Group, yeah. and if you Google Environmental Working Group um, uh, meat meat chart, you'll get it. Okay, so through the chickens and the kale. Now we have another joke, and people think it's a joke, but this is kind of actually really not a joke, um, which is to try to understand a little bit more about beef and why it has such a high um, carbon footprint. It is because of manure. 
uh, the, the nitrous dioxide and the methane that is produced from animal waste is a very concentrated uh, form of greenhouse gases. It's roughly three times as much as human um, waste is, um, and it's the fastest growing source of methane that we have. And much of it winds up because of runoff in our rivers and streams and degrading the water around them because of how the uh, confined animal farm uh, operations are, or uh, CAFOs. Um, and then the other reason is because of all the crops that it takes to feed livestock. So you've got the, foot, the carbon footprint of the food that we've grown and then feeding it to them. Then we have to transport them, kill them, process them, and move them. Um, so essentially, meat is a very inefficient way to grow food. If you, t if you took the same farmland that you grew the feed for cattle on, and you grew food that could be um, fed to humans and just directly fed it to them, that would be much more effective than um, concentrating it into meat and then uh, killing the meat. Um, there's also the water usage for cattle, which is quite intensive, and as we are heading into more water problems, uh, really does matter. So some advantages of eating less meat is you wind up uh, consuming less pesticides because the animals have eaten the pesticides that's in them. Um, there's no danger of getting meat-borne illnesses like mad cow disease or salmonella. Um, it's a lower fat diet, which is heart healthy. Um, and in general, countries with lower meat consumption have less obesity than the US, where we have very high meat consumption. Um, if most people ate lower on the food chain, we would literally be able to feed the whole planet. We could feed 2.9 billion more people. Um, one acre of grain produces five times more protein than one acre used to produce meat. And it feeds 25 people versus one carnivore. Um, and if you don't eat meat, you're not responsible for the cruelty and deaths of animals in our current um, method of, of uh, producing uh, animals. Um, so that always brings up the question, what about being vegan? Um, as I've already stated, vegan has an even lower uh, greenhouse uh, gas footprint than being vegetarian. Cheese is, uh, as we noted, the third highest um, source. Um, it does get you out of all the animal cruelty situations. Um, vegetarians and vegans get their protein from complementary proteins, which are easier to get with dairy and eggs as part of the mix. So this is a very personal decision that each person has to kind of figure out. Uh, a vegan diet does not produce enough B12 or omega-3, so one just has to be mindful and use supplements in order to be healthy with that. So I, I'm just showing this picture of what the confined animal um, farm operations look like because most people have never seen the conditions in which the animals live that we wind up consuming. Um, and there's actually, in some states now, laws prohibiting the filming of this. They really don't want you to know. <laughs> um, so in terms of policy reform in the area of eating more plant-based um, food, to me, what it would be is, is this. It would be doing some reform around the CAFIOs. OK, so we're going to switch our attention now to the issue of food waste. And we have a whole panel that's going to be um, talking in the next workshop time about food waste. So I hope some of you will go to that. Um, so 40% of the food that's produced in the United States is wasted. And this is a really tragedy because it means that all the energy that went into producing that food is wasted. Not to mention the fact that we have hungry people who are not winding up getting food. The average American um, throws out 25% of the food that they buy. Um, it just winds up getting wasted in their home. 
and that costs between $1,365 to $2,275 a year. So, you know, putting some attention on what we do with the food in our refrigerator can help that problem. Um, ways you personally can reduce waste would be label leftovers in the fridge with a date. Don't wash produce until you're ready to eat it. Preserve or freeze surplus fruits and vegetables. Use smaller plates so you don't take too much. Plan menus and buy what you need. Avoid impulse buying. And eat perishable items first and use what's in the fridge before buying more. I love this picture. It just sort of summarizes the whole situation with food packaging. <laughs> uh, I know all of you have been in this position. You go in a store, you're trying to get something quickly, you buy something, and you find it wrapped in three layers of wrapping. Uh, it's, just, it's just terrible. And all of these, you know, saran wrap and these plastics and stuff, those are petroleum products. You know, so we're, we're literally using oil to wrap up our food. Um, the other day I saw someone who had three squashes that they'd bought at the grocery store and they, and they had come in the grocery store wrapped in saran wrap. You know, what is this about? We, we don't need that. I mean, the, God made them with a very nice skin on them already. They were fine the way they were. So um, anything we can do to reduce food packaging helps the situation. And my most hated form of this is bottled water. Um, and in fact, I want to give you the very specific data about this. So um, the bottles are made from crude oil. It takes 1.5 million barrels of oil a year for these one-time use bottles. 86% um, of them wind up going into the landfill, even though we have recycling. Um, and it takes them a 1,000 years to biodegrade once they're in the landfill. Um, they ironically leak toxins back into the groundwater. It takes 50 million barrels of oil um, uh, are used every year in order to pump the water, process the water, transport the water, and refrigerate the bottled water. 40% of what you can buy in a store as bottled water is actually just tap water. It's somebody somewhere bottled for you. Um, the uh, polyethylene terra, you know, I can't say it, the PET plastic is a horn, hormone disruptor, and some of that, yes, is getting into your water. Um, and then, of course, the most disastrous thing is when they wind up in the ocean and it winds up in our food chain. Um, so there's a, a wonderful, I encourage you to Google a TED Talk by Van Jones um, where he talks about the um, uh, economic social justice issues, uh, how this affects people in poor and less developed countries, what we're doing with bottled water. So check that out. Um, so some changes around food waste. Um, one would be to support the National Food Waste Reduction Act in Congress. Um, Beth Dolio talked this morning about um, the act here in Washington that is almost to the finish line, so keep our fingers crossed. Um, another idea would be to expand the federal tax benefits for food donations from stores and restaurants when they're donating food that um, is sort of at the edge of its life but can still be redirected in a useful place. And again, the workshop that comes after this will be talking about that, um, the local efforts here to do that. Um, we can pr com promote more community and home composting. And, um, you know, composting is better than it winding up in the landfill. However, the best thing is we don't waste it and it doesn't wind up in the compost. Um, and then promoting donations to food banks um, from both gardens and fruit trees uh, is another way. So that gets us through our four parts of the food challenge, but I, I want to talk about um, some other what I would call food justice issues. 
And so one of these has to do with food sovereignty. Um, so if you look at throughout history, um, access to land and the ability to um, produce food for yourself has been the way that people have controlled whole populations. So it's really critical whether people have access to land. Um, and, it's, and it's important, therefore, the things that we do that impact other countries. So for instance, when NAFTA passed, our subsidized corn um, was cheaper than the unsubsidized uh, corn of Mexico. And it, and it wiped out all these farmers in Mexico who wound up then um, going into the cities for work. And this is part of the unemployment problem and even some of the refugees that are now coming to the US border. Um, so kind of keep your eye on who has control over food production and who, who has control of their own land. So the answer to this question is uh, displayed right there on the screen. Uh, coffee, fast food burgers, palm oil, all of those are dependent upon clear cutting in the Amazon forests of South America. And that's a picture of what clear cutting looks like. So you can see how really ugly it is. Um, so you know, solutions to that, there are uh, fair, fair fair trade grown coffee um, that are grown in shade. Um, don't get fast food burgers because they're from cows that have been grown down in Argentina and such places. And try to pay attention to whether the products you're buying have palm oil in them. Um, they're, they're, it's very widespread at this point. Um, moving away from processed foods in general will get you out of out of that problem. Um, and just for perspective, I do want to talk about world hunger for a minute. Um, world hunger went from 23% in 1990 to 13.5% in 2014, which is great, right? We're going in the right direction. But this is all threatened by climate change. Um, one in nine people in the world go to bed hungry every night. The worst continents for hunger is Africa, and the worst countries for hunger are India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. I uh, was originally going to put some pictures of hungry people in here, and uh, they were so horrifying, just really walking skeletons, that I decided not to put the pictures in here. Um, one in every 15 children in developing countries die before the age of five, 10,000 children a day. Uh, of nutrition-related deaths. So when I was talking earlier about how we can feed the whole world if we have plant-based diets and that um, meat is not an efficient way to feed the planet, we kind of have to have this perspective here about what's really going on with world hunger. Um, an estimated 14% of US households are food insecure. So this isn't just an international problem. This is right here. Um, I wanted to take a minute to also speak about uh, biofuels. Um, biofuels can be based off of plants, again, that we could be using to feed people. Uh, also, if you plant a whole field with something that you're going to use for biofuels instead of planting it for food, you're getting into that same kind of problem. Um, biofuels don't have to be bad. There are things like um, when they use the um, the stalks from corn and the husks from corn. Um, that's a good kind of recycling. There's also something called switchgrass, which is an, another good source. So just be mindful about people proposing biofuel as a solution to things. Um, it's also important for us to be really aware about the way farm workers are treated in our country. Um, most people are sort of vaguely aware of the fact that they're not covered by the minimum wage law, um, but they don't know exactly how, ba how bad <laughs> that really is. Um, here in the state of Washington, our minimum wage is $9.47. The median pay reported by the Department of Labor for farm, farm workers is $9.66. So 
pretty close to the Washington limit. However, m many um, farm workers are paid under the table. And so all the ones who are being paid under the table are being paid less than minimum wage. And so if you were to really be able to average that whole thing, you would find something that is significantly below minimum wage. Um, they are also often working in conditions where they are sprayed in the fields with pesticides, where they're not given breaks, where there's um, huge levels of sexual harassment um, to the women, um, sometimes not access to bathrooms or water. Um, so we owe a great debt to farm workers, and we need whenever we can to step up and support their requests for um, support to their unions, et cetera. Um, the, the, again, the reported average median income um, for a farm worker is 2090 a year, and that is the same as the federal poverty line for a family of three, which is the reason why many of them often can't afford to pick to pay for or buy the food that they pick. So um, the last thing I want to say about GMO, I'm not going to get into the controversy about whether GMO is healthy or not, but, will I, but what I will say is that when uh, organizations like Monsanto hold um, a monopoly on the seeds, and when they tell the farmer that they have to sign an agreement that they will then buy the seeds from the GMO every year. Um, so we're eliminating seeds that um, have been cultivated in a, in a, society, in a community uh, for a long time, many of which are drought resistant. Um, and so we get these, these seeds going. And if there's a crop failure, which there's much more likely to be under um, climate change, they, then the farmer is wiped out. They have no money um, to buy seeds for the next year, which is why there's been a very high level of suicides among Indian um, farmers in the country of India. Um, so I just ask people to think about the climate issues that relate to GMOs. So this is my favorite joke. I always end everything with it. So if you can't see what's happening there, read the words in the back, um, the guy who's standing up is asking the speaker who has a long list of positive things, energy independence, preserving rainforests, sustainability, green jobs, livable cities, renewables, clean water, healthy children, you know, kind of stuff that we're trying to cover in the conference this, today. Uh, and the question the, the person is asking him is, what if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? <laughs> So I invite you to create a better world for nothing with me. Um, so I'm going to take questions at this point. Good job. Thank you. Yes. Two questions. What's the difference between palm oil and coconut oil, and what exactly is a low till? Thank you. Um, so palm oil comes from a different plant than than coconut oil does. I mean, coconut oil is coming out of coconuts. Palm, palm oil, I, mean, I would encourage you to Google and see a picture of it. There's these big things that look almost like cones that they have to cut off the plant, and then they somehow process it to get the oil out of it. Um, but it, it's pretty labor intensive to go cut each of the things off the tree, so they often just clear cut as a way to harvest. Um, and then, of course, the tree's down, and you're not going to have it next year. Um, so that's the problem about palm oil. And then... Um, low-till. Oh, low-till. Yeah. Um, David, would you like to explain low-till? Um, the idea is that uh, one of the most destructive practices of farming is stirring up the soil. It disturbs the microorganism, disturbs the fungi, it causes oxidation and gases to be released, and destroys the soil structure that the microbes go to great lengths to create. So, the push is now on to teach farmers not to do that, what they've done for thousands of years. This is being pushed by the NRCS, National uh, no, National Resource Conservation Service. <coughs> of the and there's two sizes. One is no-till, which is to stop disturbing soil. On the other side, they're also pushing cover crops, which is to keep a green cover on the land. And the goal that they're pushing, you can believe this ambitious idea, in 
10 more years, they expect that 90% of American agricultural land will be green in the wintertime because farmers will be putting cover crops on. And they're putting this out there as a goal because they realize this is, a, this is an emergency situation. So this is a, a big issue, is dealing with how agriculture disturbs soil and, and degrades the basic part of the environment. I guess I'll toss in one more comment. I've been teaching about uh, climate change for a long time, and one thing I'd like to point out is that soil is not just a dead, inert resource. It's a living tissue. It is a living community, and it's actually the community that originally created the Earth's atmosphere by breathing out. So if we want to fix this planet, one of the first things we need to do is we need to regenerate soil because it's part of the functional tissue that creates the Earth's atmosphere. So this yeah. is, the, to me, the basement reason why we need to change agriculture is to get microbes back on the job here. Yeah. Anyway, it's enough. <laughs> well, one other thing. Yeah. I'm going to pass this around. This is a paper I brought to uh, share. Thank you. Um, so while you're doing that, the problem with palm oil is that they clear rainforests to plant the palm trees that grow the, the fruits. They don't, they don't clear cut the Plantations. The plantations. They clear cut the rainforest and then they plant these things. And it's a monoculture yeah. and all the diversity that was in the rainforest is lost. Yeah, right. Thank you for clarifying that. Lynn, I had a comment that yeah. I wanted to make. I appreciate what you said about uh, eating local and I appreciate that that's part of the on the handout that you gave us. Um, I just wanted to mention that only 6% of nationally produced agriculture no, comes from way. local farms. Yeah. And so maybe one of the best things that you can do to, um, to support uh, climate mitigation, climate change mitigation, is to support the local farmer for many, many reasons, but to grow that number. Those local farmers get some subsidies, like there's a um, farmer's market uh, production uh, a promotion program and also a CSA promotion program that the USDA funds, but it's a tiny, tiny drop in the ocean compared to how much these big uh, agribusiness subsidies are. So, anyway. I think the main thing that I'd like you to take away from this is as you think about those areas, uh, eat more local, eat more organic, eat more plant-based, and waste less. So sort of try to think about your own life and, you know, some of you have already made great inroads in some of those areas, but like, wh wh what would be your stretch area? What would be your place that like, I could do a little more on this? And then also kind of looking at, you know, what are the issues in your family? Uh, <laughs> sometimes we have resistance from other other people in our family, and sort of trying to think about, you know, how can you work with that resistance? And, you know, for a lot of us, the way we've cooked is the way we've cooked for decades. And, you know, to, to think about trying to cook in a different way is, um, it's a bit of a challenge. But, you know, as we face climate change, we're all going to have to do things that are going to be a, a challenge. Um, I hope that you will go to the food waste workshop that's in the next session. And I hope at the end of the day, you'll go to the one that's on regenerative agriculture, where you'll learn more about the sort of thing David was talking about. Um, and at the end of the day, um, when we have the action group tables, we will be having a food and agriculture um, one. And we will be talking in that about how we can take action that will help create some of the, these changes in systems that we need to see done. Because of course, there's a limit. You know, there's what we can each do individually, but then the really big change is going to have to happen on the systemic level. But yeah, David? Oh, I just want to uh, say this is uh, something I've worked on for a long time, and it's a consistent problem. People do not understand the role of food and agriculture and what's going on here. It's set aside and not dealt with in a lot of economic discussions, policy discussions, and, and uh, it happens all the time in climate change. People think about energy, they think about transportation, they think about architecture. Nobody really understands what's going on with food and agriculture, and actually it is the largest sector of greenhouse gas emissions in the whole economy. And if you look at the, the situation, not just agriculture, which is a, a big one right off by itself, but the whole food system is 
thrown into the rest of economic activity. If you pull the food out, everything from the processing and refrigeration, all those technologies, all the way to our sewage is part of our food system. All that waste is generated as part of our food system. is all part of this greenhouse gas. And so people see the tailpipes and the smokestacks and they can count the emissions. Nobody can see the fumes coming off of all those millions of acres of farmland. And we now have satellite data which shows us this, and it's been a real shock to realize that every spring right now, there's this huge outburst of nitrogen and carbon in the atmosphere, and it's due to agriculture. And we have to stop that. We have to bring that carbon back down and keep it in the soil, and that's what the paper I'm sending around is about, is how to begin to capture that carbon and put it back in the ground. And it was in 2013 in Reykjavik, Iceland, the first ever international conference on soil carbon sequestration. Over 200 scientists from 70 countries showed up. And at that conference, they looked at the numbers and they agreed that the soil can absorb all the carbon currently in the atmosphere. We can put in the soil without a problem. Also, all the green growing plants on the surface of the planet, all that carbon can also be put in soil, no problem. So this means that the soil is our largest carbon sink on the planet. And just in the last year, new information came out, and they realized that they underestimated, and actually there's four times more capacity in the soil than they originally thought. So this is now coming around front and center as becoming a primary strategy for climate change, is to move carbon into agricultural and forest and other types of soil systems. So I, in this paper, I put out three ideas. You need to create soil carbon sinks, dedicated public properties, which we're going to show how to put carbon away, rebury it. And the first one we should do is the Washington State Capitol ground should become a carbon sink. Second thing is golf courses, poster child for carbon emissions should become. And then number three are high schools like this place should become carbon sinks. And we should be showing how this is going to be done in the future. Anyway, that's, that's enough for now. You can read the paper and. This is just the beginning. I worked real hard to put together for this event. And hopefully, this idea will now get out there and begin to get people's attention mm -hmm. and begin to understand what the, the work we have to do ahead of this is all about. Thank you. So, David, you know, on the Capitol campus, there are um, gardens that serve the food bank, and they do use the regenerative agriculture practices. Uh, they have the cover crops, they use organic practices to grow the food. Um, so there's there's a little progress. Oh yeah, we're, we're making progress. Yeah. But it's still inch-wise. Yeah, you got to pick up speed. Yeah. How would you use this campus, Olympia High School, as a possible site? Would you do roof gardens? What What is your Can't suggestion? Hear. I'm, bad. I'm real hard here. Yeah. Um, I don't speak up very well. How How would you How would you turn Olympia yeah. High School into a carbon sink? Would you do roof gardens or put it on the ground? Everything possible. Rooftop gardens would be great. We know how to make real lightweight potting soil mediums to grow rooftop farms if you want. Um, the, the, the prototype for this is the terra preta soils in the Amazon. And those soils had 9 to 20 percent carbon in them. And they were uh, 2 to 6 feet deep. So this gives you an idea of how much we could do to begin to move carbon into soil. Right. Now we're just figuring this stuff out. I just two or three years ago, I read a paper where some retired USDA soil scientists did something they wouldn't normally do because they were retired. <laughs> and there was, they looked at carbon six feet deep and they discovered that plants are actually moving carbon six feet or deeper into the soil. We never knew this before. We never realized it. And suddenly there's a whole awakening going on about what soil is doing and how carbon is cycling. And other things come up is that plants don't really breathe in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. What happens is the soil breathes out carbon dioxide and the plants have their breathing pores underneath the leaves because they catch that as it comes out of the ground and recycle that. So there's a little carbon cycle right at ground level. It's going on all the time. And of course, as soon as you go till land up and put in monoculture, you ruin that whole thing and it doesn't work anymore. This is some of the things that we're learning about how carbon behaves and how we can work with carbon in the environment. One thing I want to throw up, because you mentioned about diet, this over and over, this to me is an, an, an example of one of the fundamental confusions of our species. And that is the fact that there's only two kinds of food you can eat. It's either a plant, which is made out of carbohydrates, or it's an animal, which is made out of protein. So, which do you think is our principal food? 
How many fangs do you have in your mouth? <laughs> Human beings are not predators. Meat is not our primary food. And yet, whenever we go out to eat, whenever we decide what to eat, this is the first thing we always decide. This is a big mistake. It so, changes not just what we eat, but what we eat changes the way farms are using land up. As soon as we start eating meat, everything changed out there. Not just the mess of our culture, but the intensity of it all. So to me, personal responsibility is uh, very important to recognize that on the climate side, every day we have a chance to either go that way or to turn around and head towards safety on this planet. But on the other side, the other issue nobody likes to talk about, even worse than climate change, is the plague of degenerative disease that we're experiencing. Virtually everyone today is either going to die of an accident or a disease. And that's very unnatural. It's a sign that we've gone too far, and people are concerned about maybe mass extinctions through climate change. How about degenerative disease? This is a serious problem that we're not talking about. But we are concerned about how much health care costs. But not the fact that it's not working too good for us. So this is the flip side of this issue is personal health and how that fits in everything. I'll be quiet. <laughs> Thanks, David. Yeah, so we are at time. I think um, the last thought I want to leave you with is just if you think about our original relationship as humans to the land, it was in terms of the land feeding us and us um, farming the land. And something has become very broken in our relationship to the land. And that thing which has become very broken in our relationship to the land is exactly why we're winding up with climate change, is we have not lived in good relationship to the land. So I think looking at this very fundamental part of how we relate to the land in the growing of food is, is kind of baseline, um, you know, important starting point. So thank you for coming to the workshop. And um, if whoever has the sign-up sheet can give it back to me, that'd be great. Thank you. Ultimately, the climate and everything's treated like a commodity under capitalism. Well, but I, I, short term, how can we raise a lot of hell and get people out of their passivity? I think okay? that Thank simultaneous you. to this collapse that we're in and going into these dark times, there is <laughs> an enlightenment and there is a revolution happening. And I think the kids are indicative of that. I think Extinction Rebellion is indicative of that. And these are two very strong movements that are around the world and growing daily and getting increasingly powerful. And the only thing giving them the, de the deserved press owed to them are The Guardian, and I've written about them. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pipe up about that. They don't get enough media, but that does not mean that they're not happening. And I think it's, it's we're at this point in history where people get to choose, what, what side of history do you wanna be on here? You know, do you want to be on your feet and go, you know, go forward doing the right thing or not? And it's just that simple. And I think that that level of protest is coming. And I think that it's happening. And again, um, you know, just because the corporate media is not reporting on it doesn't mean it's not happening. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you, because my life got better from reading your devastating book. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> I wanted to recognize there are these beautiful young people in your front row. Oh, and yeah. your book helped me because it has love every, all the way through it. Love, actual love with a glacier, and love with yeah. a coral reef, and love with the people of Iraq. And I wanted to know if you're right here with us and you're here with these beautiful doctors and these beautiful activists and these beautiful young people, um, what do you want to? What do you want them, especially the, these beautiful young people, to know from you right now? <laughs> Put me on the spot. Yeah. I am committed to doing everything I can for the rest of my life to help you. And that's why I'm doing this. And that's why I'm going to keep doing this. And then that's why I'm going to look at whatever it is I'm going to do next to work towards those obligations. Because you are the future generation. And uh, thank you for being here. And I, I would bet that just about everybody in this room feels the same way, that we're, we're, we're with you. And you're not alone.
fabulous. And just ask us for what you need, and every one of us is 100% obliged to give it to you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Pamela Burton from KBFG Radio, and we do uh, climate change, energy, news, hour, four times a week uh, at 10 a.m. We've covered the wonderful event that the kids put on last Friday, and they also did one in July, zero, um, zero energy um, event. And so I feel like there's a lot of opportunity here Everybody in this audience is invited to participate at KBFG. Also, there's another one of the low power. These are low power radio stations. It's a whole new way to reach out. Um, yeah, I'm going to change my name. I heard you uh, with Ralph Nader, and you convinced me to call it Climate Disruption and Energy News. Um, and I'm wondering, as you've been touring the country and talking to a lot of people like me, uh, I know on the progressive radio stations, et cetera, any new ideas? I mean, hearing about these wonderful people in your book really kept me enthralled. It's the humanity, it's the kids, it's working with others that makes a difference. Any new ideas now as you've made your tour around the country about how you might bring about change? Well, I, interestingly enough, I keep being gravitated towards and, and having younger generations brought into my life to, to work with and to talk with. And so... I don't know for sure what that's going to look like yet, but it's going to definitely be oriented around helping future generations. And, and that as well as looking more deeply into um, indigenous uh, ways of responding to this because, um, you know, indigenous populations around the country having survived a genocide, um, they've already been through what those of us in the privileged world are now looking at going through. And so I think there's some answers to be found there. But I think right now, especially while I'm on tour for this book, which is going to go on for quite a while yet, um, consistently um, more and more young people are being brought in to my life to talk with and, and sort of confer and dialogue. And, um, you know, I, I just find ongoing inspiration from you know, Greta Turnberg's spark in this fire that's now spreading around the globe. And, yeah. and we got to support that. We got to support that and find inspiration from it, you know, because uh, we are all in this together and it would be a great injustice to just like leave it to the younger generations. I mean, this is a we situation. 